Romans 2 and verse number 1. I just want to thank uh, Brother Keck for your faithfulness. The longer I'm around, the more I appreciate those who've been around for a lengthy amount of time. And I can remember missions conferences back in the old building where your family came through. So I uh, thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord and your example for so many. Romans chapter number 2, and we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Romans 2 verse 1 says, Thou therefore art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that would judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. For we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and dost the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you uh, for the service that we've enjoyed together. Lord, we thank you for uh, the Keck family and how you've used them. Lord, we thank you for your word and for this series that we've been in here in the book of Romans. I pray that you just be with us tonight as we embark on Romans chapter number two. Use it to speak to our hearts, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. What do you want, the good news or the bad news first? How many of you like bad news first? Give me the bad news first. All right. How many of you want the good news first? All right. Well, there was a study done uh, some time ago, uh, back in 2013, and it found that most people preferred uh, to have the good news, most people found preferred to have uh, the bad news shared first and then the good news to come second. But people giving the news preferred to give the good news first. And so it just depends if you're on the giving or the receiving side of it. Well, the gospel, as we know, is good news, quite literally good news. The theme for this series, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That is great news. And there's no better news. And the Apostle Paul is going to get to the good news, but he understands before we can fully appreciate the good news of no condemnation, we must feel the weight of God's wrath. Rightly directed towards sinner. Rightly directed towards the guilty. In Romans chapter number one, we caught a glimpse of the godless who have abandoned truth in exchange for lies. These are individuals who want to rid themselves of God or knowledge of God. This is a heavy hitting indictment directed at the pagan. Uh, words are used to describe them as vile and reprobate, darkened minds. We see this described in Romans chapter number one, but increasingly we see it happening all around us as well. Clearly the unrighteous are guilty before God and deserving of judgment. But now in Romans chapter number two, that indictment expands. It expands, the guilty party now grows in number. And if you're taking notes, I want you to notice first of all that the Apostle Paul points out that the moralist is exposed. The moralist is exposed. Verse number one, we read, Therefore, thou art inexcusable. That word, therefore, is found over a dozen times in the book of Romans. It's a, it's a word that the Apostle Paul uses here and elsewhere uh, to connect a preceding thought to a new thought and then build on that thought. So let's just back up one verse and look at verse number 32 of chapter number one, which reads, Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, and not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And then we get back to verse number one. Therefore, thou. Therefore, thou. Back in 2010, there was a television show called Hoarders. Have any of you seen the television show Hoarders? It deals with people who have a, a hoarding disorder. And these are people that they collect things, oftentimes trash. Uh, they attach some value to it. And maybe there's some, uh, there, 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 there's some other issues that they're dealing with as well. But you watch that show. And if you've ever seen that show, it's, it can be sad. It can be discouraging. But I remember watching that show uh, quite some time ago with Ashley and, and telling her, 
our house isn't that bad. And I mean, sometimes Ashley will get after me. Hey, you forgot to pick this up. This was on the counter. You know, she'll, she'll remind me of certain things. And so I leaned over her and was like, see, it could be way worse. You could have married one of these guys right here, you know, one of the hoarders. And that's what we like to do. We like to compare ourselves. We like to, we like to uh, compare ourselves with others. And Paul was anticipating this sort of response to Romans chapter number one. See, I'm not that bad. I'm not, I'm not like that. I'm not a Romans one type of a, a person. And so he, in response to that, he anticipates that and writes here in Romans chapter number two. You see, you can be moral. You can be conservative. You can be Republican. You can even be distressed by everything that you see in our society and still be far from God. You can still be lost. Hell is full of moral people who never came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So Romans chapter number one was not written with the intention of making us feel good about ourselves. So lest that happens, the Apostle Paul turns his pen and focuses attention to the word thou. Now, who is thou? We read here, O man, whosoever thou art that judgment, judges. This is the respectable sinner. In, in Paul's direct audience, this would have been the Jewish, these Jewish people that were highly religious. And so the moralist is the respectable sinner who, un, uh, who and, and please, let me, let me just say this real quick. Understand that adherence to God's law will lead to moral living. The Bible contains moral instructions nearly on every page. But the moral or the self-righteous or the hypocritical person, this is who Paul is addressing, is the one that believes that they have standing with God on their own basis, on their own morality. That's what we mean when we talk about the, 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 the moralist or the self Righteous or the hypocrite, the one that thinks that because of what they do, holiness is produced from within. And now I have standing with God because of what I bring to the table. And Paul is going to knock that down here. In verse number one, or in Romans chapter number one, we find repeatedly used the word they. They are without excuse. They knew God, but they glorified him not as God. They became as fools. They did not retain God in their knowledge. They which commit such, such things are worthy of death. But then we come to Romans chapter number 2, and Paul gets more pointed here with the word thou. Eight times in the few verses, uh, few verses ahead of us, we find the word thou. Three times we find the word thy or thyself. And he says thou, O oh man. This is not a specific person, but a representative character. Whosoever thou art that judgest. One of the things that Romans chapter 2 does for us is it serves as a good reminder that the gospel is not just for them or for they, it's for us. You see, it's been said that we hate our own faults when we see them in others. We come to God by grace, uh, by faith, through grace, or we don't come to him at all. Wearsby said, as the Jew uh, reads Paul's indictment of the heathen in the first chapter, he must have smiled and said, serves them right. Their attitude would have been that of a Pharisee found in uh, Luke chapter number 18. I thank thee that I'm not as other men. But Paul turns to the Jews, but Paul turns the Jews' judgment of the Gentiles right back on them. Thomas Schreiner said, what Paul needs to show is that the Jews who possess the law and enjoy a covenant relationship with God are not saved by these advantages. And so to Mr. Moralist or Mr. Hypocrite or Mr. Self-Righteous, Paul quickly turns his attention and says, I see you. You see, the, the heathen are guilty before God, but so are good and moral people without Christ. And so what Paul is punctuating here is, first of all, you have no excuse. In fact, he uses the word here, inexcusable. It's the word anapologetos. This is the opposite of apologia. And uh, we know apologia or apologetics means to, to give a defense. Inexcusable is the opposite of that. There is no defense. And so you have no excuse. So Paul's message to the moralist is, first of all, number one, you are subject to the same law. You are subject to the same law. Verse number one, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. 
Now, maybe you've ever, maybe you've had a conversation with someone before that says something effective. You shouldn't judge me. Anyone ever said that? You can't judge me. Isn't that something like Christians aren't supposed to do that? You're not supposed to judge. I think sometimes that's the most uh, misused scripture in, uh, verse in scripture. What the Apostle Paul is writing here is not to prevent believers from making a judgment. In fact, he himself, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is making a judgment. He was reminding the Jewish audience that the same rules apply. If you're going to judge others by the law, you're, you, you yourself will be judged by the same law. Christians, we ought to be careful as well in passing judgment because the same measure will be used against us. To make moral judgments acknowledges a moral law. And by the way, if there's a moral law, there must be a moral law giver. C.S. Lewis said, uh, conscience reveals to us a moral law. We saw this in Romans chapter number one. Conscience reveals to us a moral law whose source cannot be found in the natural world, thus pointing to a supernatural lawgiver. He later said, my argument against God as a one-time atheist was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how had I gotten this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has an idea of a straight line. What was I comparing the universe to when I called it unjust? And so Paul is, is calling out the, 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 the Pharisee, the, 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 the religious uh, person that is far from Christ. See, we like to grade ourselves on a curve. But what Paul is saying is if you're going to apply judgment, that same judgment will apply to you. Hypocrisy doesn't hide sin. It only compounds it. So now they're not only guilty of the same sin we'll see in just a moment, but they are also guilty of a new sin, the sin of hypocrisy. And this is what frustrated us, didn't it, during COVID, when people up in elect, elected officials in office would apply uh, uh, new laws or new rules and then break those rules themselves, right? That happened time and time and time again. And that's the Apostle Paul saying to the religious, uh, to the morally upright, be careful because as you stand and judge, that same judgment is applied against you as well. So you are subject to the same law. But then he says this, essentially, Look at here, and it says, For thou judgest, doeth the same things. What is he saying? You practice the same sins. So you are subject to the same law, and you practice the same sins. We had an incident last week at our house. We were pulling into our, our garage. We always back into our garage and uh, I had a, a dead battery one time, and it was hard to get around to get the jumper cables on it. So we decided we'll just back into the garage in case that ever happens again. So my wife was backing into the garage as the garage door is opening. Uh, we, we, we heard something. We felt something, a little impact, just something really small. And I got her permission uh, to give this illustration. But Ashley, and she was reluctant about it, but she eventually gave in. Ashley had just barely scraped the top of our van. In fact, you probably wouldn't know. I noticed it, but Ashley barely scraped the top of the van. But as soon as I heard it, I was like, Ashley, what are you doing? And this is after Bible study, and she had picked up the girls, so she was already in the driver's seat. So she drove home and backed in, just barely scraped the top, you know. And I jumped out real quick, and I'm like, man, what, how, how could you do that? Until she reminded me that I had done the same thing several years ago. I'm like, that's different. That's different. That's way different, you know. Way different circumstances. He's like, no, they're the exact same. And man, that's how, that's how, that's how we can be, can we not? And so what, what Paul's saying is here is you are subject to the same laws. You practice the same sins. Matthew chapter number five, Jesus, if you remember in his sermon, he said, ye have heard and then that it was said of old time that ye shall not kill, but whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you, and he establishes this pattern here, that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. He goes on to say, have ye heard, it was said of old time, that ye shall not commit adultery? But I say unto you, that whosoever look on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You see, he's saying you practice the same sins. They may have not been the exact sins here that we read through in Romans chapter one, number one. These sins were perhaps in their mind a little bit more respectable, maybe a little bit more sanitized sin. 
Uh, the, the sin of the moralist might have a little bit of a different tra- trajectory or a different degree, but it's the same ugly sin. And what Paul is doing here is he's linking the sin from Romans chapter number one of the heathen and of the pagan to the sin of the religious, to the sin of the moralist, to the sin of the hypocrite. You practice the same sins. James in chapter, uh, chapter two, verse 10 said, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, Yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. One of, one of my least favorite parts about living here in the Antelope Valley, and I know that these plants are elsewhere, but I hate those little goat head weeds. You guys know what I'm talking about? Any of you want to step on one of these recently? I'm pretty sure if you dive into the Greek in Romans chapter number one, you, these guys are in there somewhere, right? These guys are nasty. Like uh, my, my kids will play outside and they'll come in with their shoes and sometimes these goat heads are stuck to the bottom of a shoe. They could puncture, sometimes they're called puncture vine. They can puncture a tire. They can really uh, test your testimony if you step on one of these <laughs> late at night and bed it in the, car- in the carpet. Oh, these things are awful. Well, when it rained a few weeks ago in our backyard, I looked out in our backyard and, and our backyard was beautiful like a layer of green grass, so it seemed everywhere. And uh, I think I got a picture here of the, uh, of the, of the type of grass, and it was, it was beautiful. And I went out and looked at it. I thought, what is that? And I looked closely, and it was one of those plants. And here it was. It was actually beautiful. My thought was, this is, this is pretty. You know, it's not often in the desert that I get a layer of green covering everything, but kind of from, the, from the rain of the summer, my backyard was covered in this. Here's the deal. It's the same plant. And so this is what Paul is saying. Some of you, you, you clean up nicely, but it's the same sin. It's the same sin that condemns you to death, that separates you from God. And it may be a little prettier in your mind, but you are guilty before God because of that sin. And he links it here. And the, 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 the word inexcusable is, is, is linking back to Romans chapter number one when we read that they are without excuse. So Paul is saying you are subject to the same law. You are guilty of practicing the same sins, maybe a different trajectory, a different degree, and you will be served the same judgment. You see, there's no excuse and there's no exemption. We live in a a culture where it's easy to find an excuse. I was just looking the other day about jury duty, how to get out of jury duty. There's, uh, there is... Countless videos on YouTube coaching you how to get out of jury duty, right? I didn't have jury duty, by the way. I was just looking for an illustration, right? And there's also uh, videos about how to get out of a traffic ticket, right? There's billboards for that. Got a speeding ticket? We'll help you. We'll get out of it. And so whatever it may be that you need to get out of, whether homework, speeding ticket, uh, uh, late to work, Maybe a family gathering that you don't want to go to, jury duty. There's always a way to get out of, uh, we're we're, we're, we're ready and easy to find an excuse. But here, Paul buttons it up pretty quickly and says there's no excuse. There is no excuse and there is no exemption. Look at verse number three. Paul uses a little bit of sarcasm here and he says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doeth the same? That thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Uh, Here he's using a little bit of sarcasm in this rhetorical question. He's really making a statement in the form of question. He's stating that you won't escape the judgment. Those of you that uh, judge the things and then you do the same things, you'll not escape the judgment of God. I I, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to take a, a UV light. Have you ever had a UV light? and you put a UV light in your bathroom, maybe you've seen that on a a show before. Man, what looks like a beautifully clean bathroom, that UV light exposes all. I didn't even even bring a picture because that's kind of gross, right? But exposes everything. And it looks all clean, it looks right, and then the UV light turns on and you see the filth. What Paul is doing here is he's he's turning the UV light on our sin. Uh, Even the most sanitized, the most religious person without Christ is yet dead in their sin. It's been said that the secret hope of the hypocrite is that God will somehow judge him by a standard lower than truth and righteousness. 
For the Jews, they believe there's common tradition that there was uh, someone that would sit outside, that Abraham would sit outside of the gate of hell just to make sure that a, a Jew didn't actually go in because a Jew who enjoyed that special covenant relationship with Jesus, it would, it would prevent them. They had some advantages. And what you see later in Romans is that uh, they're actually held to a higher degree of accountability. See, there will be no parole, no shortened sentences, no pardons. The penalty, both in severity and length, is the same. And so Paul heads this off of the past. The self-righteous but lost sinner who runs, runs for cover on, under the roof of good works or religion, whether that be Catholicism or Judaism or Mormonism, uh, they are guilty before God. So the moralist is exposed. But then we see here in verse number two that God's judgment is explained. Verse two we read, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Now, man's judgment is skewed. Man's judgment is naturally biased. We've even seen, uh, uh, maybe in our legal system, judgments that were politically charged or motivated. And so man's judgment is flaw, but God's judgment, in contrast, is perfect. So we see the error of man's judgment, thinking he has any sort of standing to make judgment, really just condemns him, the Bible says here. But in contrast, Paul explains the judgment of God. Newell said, if God is judge of all and the whole world is to be brought under the judgment of God, God will surely take pains to make known the great principles of his actions so that men may know beforehand how he will decide and act. Otherwise, men would imagine vain things about the true God and hug their delusions to their own damnations. And so God's judgment is clearly spelled out in the previous chapter, in the subsequent chapters here. God's judgment is explained. But there's two things we find in this passage about God's judgment. First, that God executes judgment according to truth. God's judgment is executed according to truth. There is no variableness in God's judgment. There is no changing in God's judgment. His ways are perfect. His judgment is perfect. But then we also see that God executes his judgment against the sinner, according to the truth, against them which commit such things. Sometimes we hear phrases like, God hates the sin and loves the sinner. And he does. Those are principles we find in Scripture. But the Bible says God judges the righteous and, righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. God doesn't just send sin to hell. God sends sinners to hell. So God does love, uh, loves, uh, love the sinner and God does hate the sin. But God executes judgment against the sinner. You say, well, this is heavy. That's Paul's point here. This is why we need Jesus. This is why we need the gospel. There's no wiggling out of this, right? And so the moralists expose God's judgment very clearly is explained. But notice with me here, finally, the goodness of God extended. Look at verse number four. He asks this question, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, knowing not that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. So, so here's what we've, let's recap what we've, what we've read. You are subject to the same law. You are guilty of practicing the same sins. You'll be served the same judgment and you're rejecting the same goodness. Boy, we have a good God, don't we? We see even, even, even before you get to some of the tense verses in Romans chapter number one, you see God's goodness to us, that when he would make himself known to us through creation, through, through conscience, that, that we have the gospel. God, God is good to us. And God surely, uh, Psalm 73, surely he is good to Israel, even to such that are of a clean heart. But see, that goodness, which was to produce repentance in the heart of God's uh, heart of Israel, the Jews, they had not repentance, but rebellion. And so here we see that God is, God is good to us. He is good in, in how he has revealed himself. Uh, creation, constant. He, he's good just, uh, it, it rains on 
uh, the, 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 the wicked as, just as well as it does with us, the Bible tells us. And so we enjoy his goodness. We enjoy his creation. Just to, think that, just to stop and think of the, the beauty that we can sometimes take in. Or the relationships that we can enjoy. Or the good memories that God allows us to have. The friendships that can develop. God's good to us because none of that is deserved. We talk about God's goodness extended to us. Every breath we breathe is an extension of God's goodness. Because we are conceived in sin. We are born into iniquity. We don't deserve. We don't deserve anything that we've received. Sometimes people will say, well, why do bad things happen to good people? And that's not really the question we should be asking. Why do good things happen to bad people? Because according to scripture, we're bad people. We don't deserve the goodness of of God. James says that every good gift comes from above. And so we see there's a good God. And so it is the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Let's talk about repentance. We've heard recently messages on repentance. What is repentance? It's a change of affection and a change of direction. A change of affection and a change of direction. Sometimes in scripture, in the, in the New Testament, we read repent. Sometimes we read believe. Sometimes it's believe and repent. But wherever there's salvation, there is repentance. What if you say, well, I'm, I'm struggling with the sin that I struggled with before I was saved. Am I not saved? No, but your affection towards that sin should change. The sin that you used to enjoy should, should, should now be sin that you loathe. That's what Romans chapter number seven, Paul tells us. And so we see the goodness of God. What is the goodness? The blessings that he gives. We see the forbearance of God. That is the judgment that he withholds. The long-suffering of God, that is, that is the patience, the duration of both. We have a good and loving God. And it is his goodness that brings about repentance in our life. Well, what about those that don't repent? Well, those, for those that don't repent, look at verse number five. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasureth up unto thyself Wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of, righteous judge, of the righteous judgment of God. So you're rejecting the same goodness, but for those who, who don't repent, you can anticipate the same wrath. Whether you're moral, whether you're a quote-unquote good person, you can anticipate the same wrath. Jonathan Edwards in his uh, sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, used uh, the, the idea of a river and a dam to illustrate God's goodness and God's wrath. He said, the wrath of God is like a dam on a flooded river, holding back roaring waters rising higher and higher. The longer the river is held back, the more ferocious uh, the, the water when the floodgate is finally open. It is true that the judgment of God against your evil works has not been executed so far, the floods of God's vengeance have been withheld. But your guilt in the meantime is in constantly increasing. And you are every day treasuring up, is the word we find here in the text, more wrath. The floodwaters are constantly rising and building more and more strength. And there is nothing but mere the mere pleasure of God that withholds the roaring water back as it drains, drains mightily against the dam. Here's Paul's point that delayed wrath isn't forgotten wrath. Delayed wrath is not forgotten wrath. And the fact that God withholds his wrath because of his long suffering, because of his forbearance, that's his goodness Amen. extended to us. But we shouldn't take advantage of that. And for the, the, the lost sinner, maybe even the moral, the good person, shouldn't take advantage. Uh, uh, Paul talks about times of ignorance God winked at. But he will call all men to repentance. And then verse number six, we read, who will render to every man according to his deed? That's a sobering verse. And it's a terrifying verse if it weren't for the gospel. Spurgeon said this, God's greatest glory is that he is good. It's the brightest gem in, is, uh, in the glory of God is his goodness. We see in the Old Testament that the Lord is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. There's another verse later in Romans, chapter number 11, which reads, Behold, therefore, the goodness 
and the severity of God. To some people, that may not make sense. Like, why would you have those, those words? Those, those words seem like they shouldn't be together. Let's put severity over here and the goodness of God over here, and let's compartmentalize each and talk about each, you know. But Paul says we should consider the goodness and severity of God. Well, why is that? Because there's no appreciation for the goodness of God without acknowledging the severity of the wrath that we deserve. I found in my desk drawer this past week my library card from when I was a kid. This is the library off of Avenue J. You used to be the library. You guys remember the library? Some of you longtime Lancaster residents. So I got my library card when I was in a younger elementary age, and there was, there, was, there was no internet. Like, you had a book report. This was your only ticket, right, to go in. And sometimes my mom would, my mom would send me into the, uh, the library, and I would go and check out a book or find a book. And sometimes during the summer, she would just want us to read, so she would take us to the library. And sometimes she would send us in for a few minutes, and we'd run and pick a book by ourselves. I don't know how it happened, but I, I got in the habit of, as, as a young kid, checking books out but never returning them. And I don't know how they let me check out more books without returning them, but sometimes my mom would drive me by and say, you got a book report due. Run in there and get a book. So I'd run in there, but knowing that I didn't bring the last book back. And I was always nervous about it. Now, in retrospect, I know why my mom sent me in by myself, because she thought maybe I'd get a little more grace as just a little kid by myself, right? So I'd go in there and I'd, I'd check out another book and just hope that they would not bring up all the other outstanding books that I had. It always made me nervous. It was a little anxiety as like a first, second, third grader checking out a book from the library. Well, I remember one day in particular going out to check out some books and the librarian's jaw dropped, you know. You got a lot of books <laughs> outstanding. I was like, oh, really? I had no idea, you know. <laughs> Just look, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, all right, is this where I get arrested? You know, are they going to come in? They're going to tackle me, you know, SWAT team because all the books I stole. And I'm, I, I just remember being nervous. I, I didn't know what to say. And I remember she told me the balance. It was, it was either $36 or $38 that I owed in library fees, late fees, right? And she asked me, about, and I don't have a wallet. I don't have a card. I don't have a checkbook. I don't have a dime to my name. And she asked me, like, you know, what do I look at? Like Donald Trump standing here? You know, I'm going <laughs> to fork out some money to you. And, like, and she's asking me about it. And, and I, I just remember just looking around and starting to sweat. And like, should I just run? <laughs> you know, what should I do? <laughs> and I remember at the last minute, my mom came in. And seeing her, she came in, and she walked right up the front, and she knew what was happening, and she paid the late fees. Never in my life, never in my life did I appreciate $36. Never. Why? Because I never felt the severity. I never felt the need for it. Listen, we don't deserve anything in this life. We don't deserve God's goodness. We've rebelled against him. We've sinned against him. And what Paul is doing in Romans 1 and now for the, for the heathen, for the pagan, and now for, for the moral good person is helping us all to see the weight and the severity of our sins. And, before, and, and you can't see and appreciate the goodness of God without understanding the weight of our sins. That's why we sometimes say when we're sharing the gospel with someone, we've got to get them lost first, right? We've got to know the weight and the severity of their sins. Here's five takeaways and we're done. First of all, we should, takeaways from this passage, number one, we should walk humbly before God. We should walk humbly before God. There is no special standing that we have earned or that we deserve. Amen. We should walk humbly before God. Number two, we should trust God's judgments and not our own. Amen. His judgments are perfect. His judgments are according to truth. Our judgments are skewed. Our judgments are biased. Listen, stop keeping score. Let God handle it. Uh, maybe there's someone that's been antagonistic to you. Let God handle that. Let him make those judgments. So we should trust God's judgments and not our own. Then here's another takeaway. We should share the gospel with urgency to good people. Amen. We should share the gospel with urgency to good people. You know, sometimes we're out and about and we see someone, oh, man, that guy, he's got a job, he's got a family, uh, he's got a nice personality, he's friendly, he's my neighbor, I'll wave at him. He's a good person. Well, good people that don't know Christ, morally good people, go to hell. The Bible said that there's none good. And so sometimes we can look at Romans chapter number, number one and we can, we can cheer the Apostle Paul on, we can cheer the passage on, because yeah, those people are wicked, those people are pagan. But what about your neighbor that doesn't know Christ? We should share the gospel with urgency to good people. 
we should speak often, number four, we should speak often of God's goodness. We should speak often of God's goodness. Our, our hearts and our minds are naturally drawn to all the things that, that, that really uh, rub us the wrong way or we're disgruntled about or we don't like. But listen, we have a good God. And that good God should produce, uh, that, that acknowledging God's goodness to us produces repentance even in our heart, even as believers. Number five, we should examine our hearts and practice repentance. We should examine our hearts and practice repentance. There's a, ver- there's a verse here, a uh, word here in verse number five. Let's read that verse together, together and we'll be done. But after thy hardness and penitent heart treasureth up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. There's a word I want to draw your attention to in verse number five, and that's the word heart. I think that's one takeaway that we can have as believers is to examine our heart and understand and appreciate the goodness of God. Matthew Henry wrote, there is in every willful sin a contempt for the goodness of God. We've got a good God and his goodness leads to repentance. We don't deserve his goodness. We haven't earned his goodness. We deserve to be judged for our deeds. But I'm so thankful that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And, and took upon himself the judgment of our deeds so that we might have be clothed in his righteousness. The, the pagan, the heathen, they need God. But even, even someone who's maybe good or, or the Jew here in, in this passage or a Gentile who's a, who's a good person, we need God because the whole world is guilty before God.